Hello my friends and welcome to From Good to Great. This is a guide on encirclement and capture, which has really grown on me actually as being probably the most overpowered thing in the game in terms of generating prestige. But <clears throat> that's kind of cutting to the conclusion. So let's have a look at the traits which support this gameplay style, the encirclement and capture style, and then sort of talk about it compared to Liberator. Because this is a prestige generator. That's the main reason why you do it, although there are some other tangent benefits which we'll discuss. So the combination is Trophies of War, which doubles the amount of money you get for captures. I'll just put Inept Logistics on so I can get the other two. Uh, Deadly Grasp, which doubles encirclement penalties, which is actually quite powerful in its own right. And Flexible Command. So this has the potential to generate far more prestige than Liberator. But obviously it costs a bit more than Liberator. But you do get some extra benefits from Deadly, Deadly Grasp and Flexible Command. So. You, um, you do need the full set, really, to take advantage. And I'm just also going to discuss how encirclement works here at a really basic level. Okay. Good morning, Herr General. You have my... So, first things first. Um, there are two types of encirclement, which I'm going to talk about. So they are lock-in and your standard encirclement. And what's special about the lock-in? So, a lock-in is basically where you position two units on opposite sides of your victim. So if I position this unit here, you would think to yourself that it's encircled. But it isn't. And the reason why it's not encircled is because the edge of the map provides supply. All the edge of the map provides supply, and any uh, supply hexes provide supply. So this guy is getting supply off of the edge of the map. So you think to yourself, well, there's nothing I can do to encircle him then. But you can encircle him with a lock-in. So that's when you... Uh... Of course, I can't do that because that uh, there's a unit there that's in the way. And I'll find out now that I don't actually have any units that can reach the position that I want. Except this recon car. That'll do. Nope, even the recon car hasn't got enough movement. There we go. So these guys are encircled by these two units. And that's a lock in. This recon car would not be necessary. What's special about this is, apart from the fact that it's the easiest way to. Um, it's the easiest way to get an encirclement is to just have two units in uh, 180 degrees perpendicular to each other. Um, it blocks supply from hexes that are, that are like literally touching it. So even though this unit is on the edge of the map, it's still encircled because it's locked in. And we've all played this mission many times before. There's an artillery piece here. And it's next to this supply hex. Obviously the unit in the supply hex can never be encircled. But if you place a unit here and here, or here and here, or, um, I mean, you know, if you've captured this, then the supply hex is not a problem. But if you, if you put it here and here or here and here, you can lock the artillery in and therefore create an encirclement. So you can, unless the unit is sat in, an, uh, in a supply hex, you can always create an encirclement. Now, note that while supply comes in from the edge of the map, the terrain does matter. So you will note that some terrains have got special markers on them, like high ground and close terrain. Um, major rivers block supply, as well as dense forests and mountains, but not hills. Unfortunately, I don't think that they're actually marked 
in the information as blocking supply, which is a little bit... Um, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit of a shame that that information is missing. But the rule of thumb is, is that if you can't cross it with infantry, then it blocks supply. So, small rivers don't block supply, but large ones do. Mountains do. And I, I am aware that there is an infantry type that can cross mountains very quickly and, and so on, but um, I think a better rule of thumb would be to say that if it blocks a... Uh, if it blocks a, blocks a light vehicle or horses, then it blocks supply. But the terrain types you're looking for are dense forest, not standard forest, but dense forest, uh, mountains and large rivers all block supply. Okay, so we put this guy in, a, in an encirclement here with a lock-in. Fair enough. So what's this about capturing? And we'll also talk about what in what encirclement does to the enemy so say I wanted to capture this unit which is worth a small fortune just remember I've only got 520 prestige here so I can obviously lock him in pretty easily but here I'm gonna use the uh, the split feature to start really surrounding him Okay, so we've got him in a lock-in here between these two. At the moment, I can't, um, I can't put him in a full surround. So, what is this doing for me? Well, it means that any suppression that I inflict on him is going to carry on into the next turn. So if I hit him now with this artillery... That suppression, that five suppression, is going to carry on into his turn. And in addition to that, encirclement does two suppression at the start of their turn. But in the case of the traits that we've picked, it's four, not two. Because we've got the, uh, the deadly grasp ability, which doubles the penalties. So at the start of his turn, he is going to have a suppression of nine, which is enormous. That's pretty bad. Uh, obviously you can follow up with things like the level bomber. It's the perfect unit for adding suppression. I would usually say it's the perfect unit for adding suppression without dealing casualties. Because you don't actually want to kill the units that you're trying to capture. The whole point of capturing them is to convert them into money, into, into prestige. So, anyway, we won't worry about this infantry too much. I'll probably just kill it. Okay, we'll leave it for one turn. There's not much you can do anyway. Okay, so let's end the turn. I'm totally not worrying about my strategy here, because I just want to show encirclement off. Okay, so you'll note here that these boys are now six suppressed. So they took the two suppression earlier, and then they took another four at the start of their turn. Now this cavalry is up to 11 suppression. So how surrender works is if you do more damage than 66% of base suppression, then you get the... they may surrender, basically. You get a roll on it. It's a bit of a mystery to me why sometimes they surrender and sometimes they don't. But the ideal way to to get a unit to surrender is to completely suppress it and then poke it for one damage. That's usually the way that you get the job done. Okay, so we've got a base suppression here of 12. So that means if I do one casualty, 12 out of 13, if I do one casualty, that should be enough to cause it to consider surrender. Okay, so, obviously when you hit a unit and it might surrender, what it will usually attempt to do is run away. So, using our flexible command, we can split our units 
to basically lock our victim in. Um, I could even split the artillery here to lock him in further, but that um, I'll use the tank instead. Now, the reason why flexible command is so important to this, it's not just about creating a total wall in. It's also about doing less damage. So, again, you know, kind of an obvious thing to say, but you're only going to get whatever survives to surrender. So if you use a full strength tank here, you might kill four or five of this unit. And you don't actually want to kill four or five of it, you just want to kill one or two. And have the rest surrender. So by splitting up your unit, you're actually creating a sort of lower attack value, which is actually useful in, in the capturing process. Um, so, at, at the moment we have 540 uh, prestige, there's 20 per turn for 15 turns, right? So that means there's like 300 and... no, hang on. Yeah. 350 prestige on the map, right? The entire map is worth 350 prestige. Now watch how much we're about to stick in our pockets. <laughs> so uh yeah that was 400 and uh and 40 more more than the entire map is worth literally more than what the entire map is worth um in terms of the uh the prestige bonus and this is what what they mean by capturing encirclement and capture can just print prestige for you. It, it's actually pretty absurd. If you think about what Liberator does for you, 25, 50, 75, 100, 125, um, 175, 225, 275, 325. So we have gained more prestige in that one move than we would have gotten for the whole map for, for Liberator. I mean, Liberator is steady, reliable prestige, but this technique has the potential to feed you so much money. And it can just get really, really out of control for you. It's like, who, you know, looking at this infantry here in the lock-in, who cares if you take four casualties on your artillery? If you're going to walk away with hundreds of prestige per, per capture. Now, obviously not in this case, because infantry are, are just not that valuable. Okay, so this unit here is uh, 9 out of 12. It's not quite suppressed enough. So I would normally recommend that you wait a turn before you try and capture it in that circumstance. But let's just end it. Alright, so five of them survived after that. And how much did we get? 60 prestige, something like that? I mean, 60 prestige is a lot. That's almost... Uh, with Liberator, that's almost three three sort of low-level cities worth of extra prestige that Liberator would have granted you in addition to what you have. Now, obviously, some units are juicier than others. You can check their juiciness by uh, opening up the information panel and seeing how much prestige they've actually they're worth. Cavalry, especially, is very juicy. This Polish cavalry here is only worth 200, but there are some cavalry out there that's worth 300 or 400. You can see here the German cavalry is worth 290. There will be cavalry around that is that has this kind of value and will absolutely be worth um, be worth capturing. Once you're done, of course, you can relink up your units and, and push on. Um, 
there are some risks. Obviously, having your units split is a risk in its own right because they're going to be weaker split. Um, some of the really expert players out there have spent so much time and money capturing that their units don't actually have very much experience points because they've been capturing everything and not actually getting kills. And kills is uh, kills leads to experience points. I, in the late, later parts of my Generalismus campaign, I actually spend prestige, you know, just fighting infantry against infantry kind of kind of a thing, and then reinforcing because it generates loads of experience points, which you know is going to lead you to a stronger composition in the future. And uh, if you go go crazy with captures, you may find yourself. Um, you may find yourself in a position where your units are actually garbage by halfway through the campaign because you never, you never actually killed everything and, and gained uh, gained all the experience points from doing that. Just something to consider. I don't think it's the biggest concern for everybody out there, but um, just remember the piece of advice which I've I've given a few times, but I want to make it really clear in this video. Take the turn limit. As a uh, as a time, as a suggestion, as in you're aiming to finish by turn 15. You're not aiming to finish by turn 10 or turn 8 or as fast as you possibly can. You want to use every turn to extract value out of each map. And so this uh, this setup really enables you to. Uh, to farm the you know farm units that are on their own in maps where you've got plenty of time, or maybe you don't feel like you've got plenty of time, but then you start you get to, towards the final objective or whatever, and you've got four or five turns left. These might be opportunities for you to set up an encirclement and start stealing units left, right, and center, because there's just you know so much money to be had doing it. Now. There are a few things to do with splitting, which I also want to cover. So, just to make it clear, supply... So, we mentioned that supply comes from the edge of the map and supply hexes. Supply is blocked by the unit that... The square... Or the hex that the unit is sat on. And every hex around it. So... You only need two units. If you do a lock-in, you only need two units. Because, in theory... So these two units here create a lock-in. In theory, they block the center tile plus the two next to them. Well, not in theory, in practice. So that's every tile blocked. And therefore, the unit in between them can't get any supply. But uh, I thought that rivers blocked supply for the longest time, and they don't. It's only the large river that does. So if you look at this situation here... If you wanted to block supply to this whole area, you've got this large river here. You need to put one unit here, which blocks this tile and this tile. So that prevents the supply from escaping here. You want to do a lock-in here. In fact, you want to do a lock-in diagonally like this. Because that locks in this, and the unit here would block here, here, and here. Then you want a unit here. To block these two forest tiles. Um, one here, one here, and one here, which would block here and here. And that is how you would totally entrap this whole area. But obviously you have to do a lock-in here because of this supply hex. The supply cannot escape the supply hex if you lock it in. Um, I guess the only un unfortunate thing is that in the late game, a lot of places where you might you might find that a uh, a surround is like really doable and really valuable, you'll usually find that the enemy city has got a supply hex, and you can't actually um, you can't lock them in. Okay, this is just a demo anyway, so I'm not really bothered about losing that. 
So you'll note here, he's on the edge of the map, so I'd have to be here and here. I'd have to lock him in to actually... Um, encircle him. Now, one last little thing, which I want to talk about flexible command. There are some tricks with flexible command. It mostly involves recons. Um, and some other units that have similar bonuses like artillery. So I have three undos here. I should have put unlimited undos on so I could show this properly. This artillery is going to do like one damage it looks like. Okay, so you can get the bonuses twice. So if you were going to split your recon. You can actually get two recon accuracy bonuses instead of one. Now what's funny is each shot of artillery depending on its uh, on its artillery damage trait. So here entrenchment killer times two. This artillery will do two damage to someone's entrenchment you can get it up to four with the same technique. As in, if you split this artillery, both artillery, both splitted, splitted? Is that a good word? Both sections of the, of the now split artillery um, will do that, that two entrenchment damage. So it's not reduced by the fact that they're split. So if you have flexible command, you can actually magnify your bonuses uh, against the enemy. And that may matter situationally. The best thing about doing it with recon cars, of course, is that you can then stick them back together again in the same turn. So that they're not at risk. Just something to consider. So I suppose in an ideal world you'd want to capture that artillery. Uh, cavalry. Unfortunately, because of where he's positioned, he makes it very difficult for us to do this. You probably don't want to burn this many turns trying to, uh, trying to capture something like this. But we might be able to persuade him to actually walk into it. There we go, he walked into it. And now he's locked in. Bad times for him. Now, the funny part is, all of this benefits you. I mean, even taking damage actually generates experience points. All combats generate experience points. So as long as you actually get a worthwhile amount of prestige out of your, uh, out of your victim, it's totally worth doing. Note that one good way to actually capture units is to push them into a river tile. If I, if an enemy unit was like here and you wanted to capture it, um, one good way of doing it is to just force it to retreat into the river tile because that destroys all of its movement. And then with its movement destroyed, the next hit that triggers a surrender roll will cause that unit to surrender. It won't, it won't be able to move again. Uh, one thing to note as well, there are some very cheap, like literally one core slot level bombers. And they're, uh, they're not bad for, uh, for trying to get captures. So you'll note here, 
He is suppressed by six now. So at the start of my at the start of his turn, he's gonna take the four suppression penalty from Deadly Grasp and uh, and have be maxed out in suppression. So now he's t he's totally maxed out in suppression. So any hit that will that inflicts a casualty will result in them surrendering. Or should result in them surrendering. Boom. And you'll note here that uh, we have pocketed a truly a truly vast sum of wealth. So anyway. Hopefully this covers all the basics of how encirclement works, what it does, um, how how capturing works, and how this combination of traits can lead to a vast quantity of prestige. One thing I would say is this is probably more prestige than you will ever need. Um, people who are playing through on General Ismus are finding themselves with some minor prestige problems, if they're really good. They're finding maybe some minor prestige problems, but not really. Um, except finding the 10,000 to pay for the alternative history you, uh, route. But generally speaking, Liberator is, is all you really need to have enough prestige to get through um, on Generalismus. This allows you to generate so much prestige that I don't think prestige will ever be a problem. The only thing is, of course, that um, prestige does not necessarily convert into power. If you're playing on a lower difficulty level, you'll find that you have so much prestige that prestige is never the limiting factor in the power of your army. This is why things like uh, Killer Team are so good. You know, if you get a zero slot hero with Killer Team or double tack fire, uh, rate of fire or double turn or whatever, you're gaining more power in your army. You're gaining more slot value of power to deploy each mission. And I guess the issue with this is that it, it generates so much prestige that prestige will not be the limiting factor. But prestige is very rarely the limiting factor anyway. I mean, obviously it comes in handy if you want to buy like the Gustav artillery or something. Um, but even then, that artillery uses up seven core slots. And so you might find that your core slots are the limiting factor on that as well. So what I'm basically trying to say is that if you just take Liberator and just play well in Generalismus... The, this combination of perks as your prestige generator um, might might actually just be overkill. It might be more prestige than you know what to do with. And then you might find that your, your army is actually weaker than it could have been if you hadn't have taken it. If you'd have taken things that actually make your army more powerful. Now, that said, you know, splitting recons to get extra extra recon bonuses, splitting artillery to defeat entrenchment more quickly, and deadly grasp, obviously suppressing units by four every round instead of two. These things do add a lot of power. If you use them to make battles easier, then they will add power to your, to your army. But the temptation will be to use them to make money, and if you can't resist that temptation all the time, you may find that uh, you're spending all this time sort of making money. You may lose maps <laughs> just because you wasted too much time trying to make money and having to play again. Or, um, you know, overextending yourself, leaving split units in vulnerable positions and all that kind of stuff. That there's a lot of risk involved in doing this, but the you know the potential to make a fortune, especially in the early phases of the of the uh, grand campaign, uh, is definitely there. And there are certain other maps as well where you get tank rushed and so on. 
where with this combination of traits and maybe Master of Blitzkrieg, you could uh, just envelop a whole ball of tanks and then force them all to surrender and, and make prestige hand over fist. And with force suppression at the start of their turn, I mean, that's nearly half the fighting strength of the unit. So once you actually get a surround on, on an enemy unit, it's very hard for them to escape it because as long as you just re-establish the surround before their turn begins, you can keep piling the suppression on. With Deadly Grasp, it only takes two turns for them to be totally crippled. So anyway, I just put this together because people were asking sort of how encirclement works and how capturing works. So I hope this explains how it works. Um, my apologies if this is kind of a bit a bit simpler, a bit obvious for some of you guys. Um, but maybe the whole splitting bonuses might not have been so obvious. But yeah, if if you're having trouble with prestige, then definitely consider this combination and maybe add, adding Master of Blitzkrieg because that will let you um, it will let you get surrounds a lot more easily. A lot of maps feature rivers. Um, and the extra movement point and the ability to ignore small rivers is actually pretty huge. Will allow you to get encirclements that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Um, but just uh, just be cautious because the siren call of greed of money it may cost you in the long run. Um, I don't know if this is going to get nerfed or not because it does actually feel to me to be game-breakingly powerful in terms of how much money it can generate. But uh, for now, this is how the game works, so enjoy your encirclements, and uh, hopefully this explains everything, and I will see you guys next time. If there's any questions or anything that I missed, just uh, drop it in the comments, and I'll, and I'll try and answer them for you. Okay, I'll see you guys next time.